I'm Roger Edmington. Last week, we took a break from our series in James to honor mothers. Today, we're back in a fifth of a six-week series on the little letter of James. Now, James didn't believe that his big brother, Jesus, was really the Son of God until later. And then he became a leader in the Jerusalem church after Jesus' resurrection. And in his five chapter letter to Christians, James throws some hard punches really toward those who, who don't get serious enough about their faith to put it to work because faith works. It does, it, it calls you to action. In fact, faith so completely takes God at its word that it's willing to do whatever he says. Faith is really a response of, of the heart to God that completely alters the way you live. You don't just think by faith. You don't just feel by faith. You actually live by faith. Faith invites God to work in every aspect of our lives. Now in this series, we learned that faith works in the tough times. For the people he was writing to, many of them were experiencing true persecution because they were followers of Jesus. And it also works in those tough moments for people all around the world today as we're dealing with this invisible enemy. We keep wondering whether it's on our hands, whether it's in the air, whether it's on our clothes, or, or whether it's somewhere hiding just to attack us. Faith works in your very toughest struggles, whether you're lonely or whether you're confused or whether you're even feeling useless at this time. In our series, we also said that faith works as you turn around and, and look at the mirror to, to evaluate your life. And then evaluating it, you'll make some big changes perhaps, or, or maybe some that might even seem small about how to live out your faith, your trust in God. And faith also must work in our words. Perhaps as we discussed a couple of weeks ago, you were uh, stirred to maybe make some changes, to commit to make changes in your words, to tackle that bad habit that you've had uh, of language that's not really honoring to God, or, or maybe to quiet that critical tongue of yours. You determined to use your words to build up rather than to tear down. Now today we look at the fourth chapter of James and we want to talk about war. That is a battle that all of us are involved in, whether we know it or not. It's an underground battle, it's an underground battle with a different invisible enemy. It's a battle that nobody sees and in fact, a lot of people don't even acknowledge it. It's a quiet conflict but it causes big problems that can come out in our lives in a way that are not very quiet. Faith works on the battle within us. James begins chapter four by asking one of those classic questions, one to which everybody needs to know the answer. He says in verse one of chapter four, what causes fights and quarrels among you? What a great question. That's a great one, isn't it? I mean, what causes wars in Iraq and Afghanistan? What causes wars in Israel and Syria in South Sudan and Nigeria, in Vietnam and Yemen? What causes gang wars over turf? And closer to home, what causes conflict? What causes arguments among brothers and sisters and husbands and wives and, and colleagues at work? What causes knockdown drag out so bad that sometimes people have to call the police? What causes those fights, James is asking. And James answers it. It's, he says, don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Somebody wants something and they don't get it. You think your rights have been violated? He should have met your need. She should not have done that to me. He shouldn't have spoken to me like that. A country fights for its national interests. It wants what it wants. 
You want something and you don't have it. You want to get out of the house and go somewhere, but you can't. So what do you do? So the point number one that I want to make is that your internal battle causes external wars. It's the battle within that's the most important battle in your life to win, the battle over your own desires. Now James introduces the idea of evil desires back in chapter one, verse 14. We talked several weeks ago about how evil desire is conceived when one is tempted and then it develops inside. And when it's fully grown, it finally comes out in sinful action. And of course, the consequences we know of sin is death, spiritual death. Paul found this underground battle hit him personally, and as he explained to us in Romans chapter seven. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my, my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. So it's your battle, it's my battle. And as followers of Jesus, we have two desires ranging within us. We have the desire to follow Jesus. We made that commitment to him and we really want to follow him. But there's also a contrary desire that's trying to take us off in different directions. We cannot act like there is no conflict going on. We have to address those underlying feelings and desires. Now some of our feelings can actually lead to destructive attitudes, to destructive uh, actions, both to others and to ourselves. And those underlying feelings then eventually become settled conditions that lie be beneath the surface. So to deal with the surface issues is never enough. It's what's going on inside, below the surface, that really matters. Because these underneath feelings start to creep into other areas of your life and they begin to take over your whole personality, often without the person even knowing it. There's something we all know about feelings. Feelings can master you, or you can master your feelings. Feelings often live in the front row of our lives, kind of like unruly children uh, clamoring for attention. And those who continue to be mastered by their feelings, such as anger and fear and lust and greed and desire for status or power or popularity, those are, are typically persons who in their heart of hearts believe that their feelings must be satisfied. I have this feeling, so I have to express it. I, I have to fulfill it, it just has to come out. And if you wanna be really current, you add, well, it's just, who I am. I just need to be true to myself. I must fulfill those desires. It's, it's who I am. And a lot of people just can't imagine who they would be without satisfying their feelings. Even the critical attitudes, the power plays that come from wounded feelings that we may have received years ago at home, at school, on the playground, or at work. But this creates what Dallas Willard calls a ruined person, a ruined person. Uh, when I first heard that, I was like, wow, that is a really strong word. But we're all ruined because of sin in our lives. And here we're ruined because we allow our feelings to be God. And we know that if anything except the real God becomes a God, then it's idolatry. And of course, that's sin. Willard writes this in his classic book, Renovation of the Heart. He says, in modern times, feelings exercise almost total mastery over the individual. When people must decide what they want to do, feelings are all they have to go on. And that's why contemporary Western life is particularly prone to gross immoralities and addictions. People are overwhelmed with decisions and can make those decisions only on the basis of feelings. 
And as a result, people cannot distinguish between their feelings and their will, and they confuse feelings with reasons. They lack self-control, which is the steady capacity to direct yourself to accomplish what you've chosen or decided to do and be, even though you don't feel like it. Without self-control, people drift through the days and years using addictive behavior to endure. So what do you want for dinner tonight? Would you like hamburger or fish or, or chicken or ice cream? Now, following your feelings on that could be pretty harmless, really. Or, or I guess it could lead to a health problem if you always feel like you need ice cream. But what about when it has to do with deeper desires, relationship uh, issues and other things like that? My wife asked me to do something and I don't want to do it. And that makes me angry. So I yell at her and I put her down. I like flirting with that lady over there, so I will. I don't feel like paying all my taxes this year, so I think I'll just fudge on them a bit. I like the way I feel in that car, though even though it'll put me in debt, I'm gonna do it anyway. For me, I feel hungry all the time, so I feel like I have to satisfy that hunger. In reality, it's it's not hunger at all. It's just, I like the feeling of food and, and that taste in my mouth. I have to master this feeling rather than let it master me. I have to win the battle. Now in contrast to the person who lets his feelings be God, be God the one who lets God be God accepts that feelings don't always have to be fulfilled. Every itch doesn't have to be scratched because not all itches are godly itches. They're desires to battle and to win. James goes on to, to describe specifically how this works in verse 2. He says, you want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So James tells us, our second point here, is your desires are worldly, not godly. Now there are two ways in which this is worldly. First, you use the world's methods. That is, you want, but you don't get because you want, but don't ask God. The people who James writes about may call themselves Christians, but they're really full of jealousy and selfish ambition, anger, and, and other ills that just really mimic the culture around them. It's not following Christ if you just duplicate the world around you. And when someone wants something, they just use the world's methods to get it. If it costs money, then they just work harder or they bite their way up the ladder. It doesn't matter how they get there or they just buy it with debt rather than wait with patience and self-control. They envy and covet and do whatever it takes to get what they want. Now James actually takes this to, to a real extreme. He says, you kill and covet. And some people, of course, actually do kill someone to get what they want. But I think the more likely temptation for most of us is just to kill somebody with our words or kill somebody by cutting them off out of our lives. But really, that doesn't bring people what they want. And you and I both know by experience that quarreling and fighting don't really get you what you want either. I have plenty of experience growing up of quarreling and yelling at my older sisters to try to get what I want. But in reality, even if I got what I wanted, it didn't bring me joy, it didn't bring me peace, it didn't really produce anything good. James says, you can search for what you want in your dead ends and your empty buckets. I wonder if you've ever looked for something in a drawer 
and you couldn't find it. And so you, you took the drawer and you, you dumped it out and, and you looked through everything and you know it's got to be there, but you can't find it. So you put it all back in the drawer and then you come back and you look at it again. You, got to, you, you know it's there. But the truth is, it's not there. You're looking in the wrong place. And for people who are looking for peace and joy and meaning and hope, fulfillment of love, but, but keep trying to get it with the world's methods, they're looking in the wrong place. It's just not there. It's not in the desire for more. It's not in the desire for money. It's not even in family or friends. And James says, you don't get because you don't ask God. And the first thing we should ask God for is wisdom. And that wisdom really helps us to know what we should ask for. And we know that God gives wisdom. Back in chapter 1, verse 5, he says that pray for wisdom, ask for wisdom, because God gives you the kind of wisdom that provides wholeness and really peace in our lives. Okay, you might say, well, I ask, but I still didn't get what I wanted. And James says, well, perhaps it's because you have the world's motives. You have the world's motives, and, and that means that you're going to ask without receiving. James chastises his readers for their prayers because they're really marked by selfishness rather than by trust in God. You don't get from God because you have ungodly motives. You ask for your own pleasure rather than for God's will to be done. And since you ask with wrong motives, you often ask for the wrong things. Now today, you and I will probably be tempted to buy into the delusion that we're smarter than God. And when you presume that you know what's best, prayer becomes arrogant. It becomes just asking for what I want. But God's wisdom is often at odds with our own wisdom and with our own desires. And what we need is, is willingness to be molded by God's will, to, to listen. So God's way of asking is to ask with pure motives. Now, James, you know, <laughs> is never one to mince words. And he has some strong words for these people who are supposed to be in a close covenant relationship with God. In verse 4, he says, you adulterous people. Wow. Uh, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he's caused to dwell in us? James sees that those who are breaking their commitment to God are really adulterers. And God frequently rebukes Israel in the Old Testament with that same charge to let them know that they're straying from God. They're going away from their real love. And Jesus echoes this in Matthew 12 when he says a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign. So James is warning all of us that being a friend of the world has disastrous consequences. It has disastrous consequences because it makes us an enemy of God. If you and I have the same desires as the world has, for status, for prestige, for wealth, for power. We just allow the world to squeeze us into its mold and instead of allowing God to shape us with his own spirituality, with his own approach to who he calls us to be. Believers choose friendship with the world without realizing the consequence. It puts you on opposing sides to God. We become God's enemies when we live as the surrounding culture tells us to live. Jesus, of course, says it straight as well. He says, you can't love God and money at the same time. Both James and Jesus want Christ followers to wake up, to, to rub the sleep out of our eyes, to look in the mirror and see ourselves as we really are. 
John writes in his little letter, chapter two, he says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now the reason God says this through John and through James is that God wants the very best for us. He is a righteously jealous lover who doesn't want you running around with somebody else. The spirit he created in us and the Holy Spirit he gave to us desires God's best for you. He doesn't want you to just settle for the, the pleasures of this world. He doesn't want you to be fighting and quarreling over those things, over those people. He doesn't want you to hurt each other with your words. He desperately wants you to come to live with him in full harmony. And he knows that if you search for meaning with the world's methods and the world's motives, that you won't find meaning. So you can either be God's friend or you can be the friend of the world, but you can't be both. But God offers a lifeline. I'm glad he does. He offers a lifeline for those of us who sometimes don't know how serious the situation is when we follow the ways of the world. In verse six, he says, but he, God, gives us more grace. It's not just a one-time thing. He gives us more grace. And that's why scripture says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So the fourth point I'm making here is that pride limits your receptivity to grace. If you're thinking only of yourself, if you're thinking only of your own desires, what you want, how much you've accomplished, you can't receive God's grace. Grace is only available to those who know that they're sinful and know that they need a savior. God opposes the proud because there's no way they can accept what God wants to give them. Humility, coming before him humbly, is the only way to approach God. Your prayer might be like this, Lord, I know I'm still proud. I'm still selfish. I still want to rule my life by myself. I know that I've been tied too tightly to the world. I'm still tempted to assess my day by what pleased me rather than what pleased you, Lord. I'm still tempted to forget that I was bought with a price and I need your grace, Lord. I need more grace. I want to give myself to you completely, my desires, my longings, everything to you. So that's the prayer of the humble person whom God loves to give grace, grace, and more grace. James then gives us 10 imperatives, which are kind of like a recipe of how to be humble before God. He says in verse seven, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. So the first imperative there is to submit yourselves to God. And it starts here really because submission to God opens you to God's grace and power. Now, I have to tell the truth, <laughs> submission is never natural for us. Because as Paul David Tripp wrote, sin causes us to all be little self-sovereigns and self-appointed many kings and queens. And what we really want is for our kingdoms to come and our will to be done right here, right now in our jobs and our families. We love being in control. We love getting our own way. We love being indulged and served. We have a wonderful plan for the people in our lives. <laughs> that is, if God will just submit to our will. And even though it doesn't feel natural, unless we submit to God, there's no path to receiving the grace, the, the big grace that he wants to give us. 
So you submit, but you must also resist. We must resist the devil in the battle. The same way that God resists, he opposes the proud, we also resist, we oppose the devil. And the reason we can resist the devil is because God and God the Holy Spirit in us is stronger than the devil. And that power of the Holy Spirit he gives believers is able to overcome Satan. The power of Satan was severe, severely curtailed at the cross and at the resurrection of Jesus. So we can resist. We have that power. God has given us the power. In the famous screw tape letters, C.S. Lewis suggests that there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devil. One is to disbelieve in its existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. So if we don't believe in the devil, how can we resist him? And if we're too interested in, in, in him, then we will get caught in his web. So your first freedom is where you put your mind. Nobody can control your mind but you. Now, of course, there are plenty of destructive images and negative ex experiences that, that try to control us. But think about it. People in the darkest dungeons have had some of the most beautiful thoughts. We think about the Apostle Paul when he wrote the book of Philippians was in prison. And we call Philippians the epistle, the letter of joy. And Paul shows us by that and many other ways that we can control our thinking. So I have to ask myself, with what do I fill my mind with? I mean, what ideas and images am I giving airtime to my mind? Part of resisting the devil is recognizing the images that he puts in your mind. And you have to choose to replace those destructive images with the positive ones, with the, with the meaningful ones, with the constructive ones that God wants us to have through his truth. Now, we probably don't succeed in resisting the devil by saying, I'm just not going to think about that. I, I'm not going to do that. No, instead, over time, we train our thoughts. We train our feelings by constantly putting God's truth in the forefront of our thoughts. Paul challenges us to renew our mind, and we must do that regularly. We often input truth and love to replace the destructive thoughts of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And James says when we resist the devil, the devil will flee from us. We think about Jesus in the midst of that wilderness, that desert, when he was being tempted by the, by the devil. He had three big time temptations and he overcame all of them by the truth of God's word. He quoted scripture to the devil. And then the scripture says the devil left him. Now, of course, the devil did return, just like he returns to us. And he tempted Jesus with many other things among his life because Hebrews tells us that Jesus was tempted in every way that we are, and yet he didn't sin. And so we must also be armed, ready for the battle at all times with truth on our minds, on our hearts. And as we resist, we must intentionally move toward God. James says, come near to God. And the only reason we can come near to God is because he's already come near to us in Jesus. We accept his invitation as if the king is saying to us, come near, my son. Come quickly, my daughter. Please approach. And when we make that move, God comes even nearer to meet us. And as we come near through the spiritual activities of inputting God's truth and quieting our hearts and, and talking with God and listening to him, that underground battle is being won and the unseen enemy is being defeated. James also writes, wash your hands, 
and purify your hearts. Now, as a child, I don't know how many times my mother said to me, wash your hands, Roger. And of course, now everybody is being told, wash your hands, wash your hands. Sing happy birthday twice. Sing a song, do something. Wash your hands really well. You don't know what they've touched. You don't know where they've been. You don't know what has touched you. You don't know how this invisible enemy is attacking you. But long before our directive to wash our hands, James tells us how important it is to wash away the dirty sin in our lives. Just like soap and water and hand sanitizer take away your dirt and those microscopic germs, God will take away your sin. But you have to come to him. You have to wash your hands of those germy actions that we all have. And he wants us to purify our hearts where those germy actions really start. God wants purity, not double-mindedness. He wants you to be devoted to only one thing, to him. And James tells us to grieve over our sin. He says, take your sin seriously. How can you live God's best when you're trying to hide your sins and act like everything is just fine? How can you win the battle within if you don't even know there's a battle to fight? James uses four words to show us how seriously we must deal with our sin. He says, grieve, mourn, wail, and change. Because sin divides us from God. It's a big deal. It's worth realizing how hurtful it is to God and how hurtful it is to ourselves and others around us and to where God wants to take us. So if you're laughing because you're so tightly connected with the world, put on your black dress, put on your black suit and go into mourning. Submission to God requires knowing how severely sin breaks your relationship with God. And it's an important step in winning the battle. And James concludes these 10 imperatives with the word we've used before, humble. Humble yourselves before the Lord, which results in being lifted up by God. Now, I know this is counterintuitive. It just doesn't seem right. Everything we're told in our world is to lift yourself up. Show yourself how good you are. Show people how good you are. Elevate yourself. Fake it if you have to. That's the only way you'll be able to get anywhere in life. But God says, I'm sorry. It just doesn't work that way with me. And the truth is, if you realize who God is, there's no option but to be humble before him. When you realize that you're in the presence of the king of kings, you bow down with your eyes to the ground. And then the king will come and touch your chin and ask you to rise. He will lift you up. And so you can choose either to exalt yourself and not be with God, or you can allow God to lift you up as you humble yourself. It's one or the other because God opposes the proud, but he lifts up the humble. Now, when we lose the battle within, it often comes out in negative talk against someone, often someone closest to us. And James, as we've mentioned before, is not finished with our battle with the tongue. This is the third time in his book that he talks about our battle with the tongue. It's his war, it's our war against unhelpful words. And it continues. He writes in verse 11, brothers, don't slander one another. Don't use those words to, to knock people down, to tell untruth. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him, speaks against the law and judges it. And when you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but you're sitting in judgment on it. There's only one lawgiver and one judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? 
The sixth point is judgment is not your job. It's not your job. I mean, it's so easy to take God's job, isn't it? Probably most of us have a, a battle within on judging others. I know I do. I, I find it so easy to have a critical spirit of, of putting other people down, trying to lift myself up somehow. But Jesus said it all so straight. He said, do not judge or you too will be judged. When we judge others, we not only take God's job, but we also invite judgment on ourselves. James is not saying that you can't have an honest and healthy discussion among believers about what is good, what is true, what is right, and who speaks the truth and who does not. But he's warning us how easy it is to step over the line and actually go into judging someone. So James says it simply. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Don't take God's job. He knows what he's doing. James concludes this passage with uh, a passage that I often read at funerals and memorials. But it's really important to remember at any time. It's verse 13. But now you who say, Today or tomorrow, we'll go to this city or that city. We'll, we'll spend a year there. We'll carry on business and we'll make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag and all such boasting is evil. So in that battle within, we live tentatively with God's will in mind. We live tentatively. Our confidence is often based on false assumptions. I'm going to do this and I'm going to make it happen. And James is not against us making plans, but, but making plans without considering God's will is crazy because life is transitory. You don't know what, would, what will happen. You didn't know you were going to be in the midst of a pandemic right now. And when you make plans, assuming that you know what is best and that you know what's going to happen outside of you, you're presuming. You're presuming on God. We probably all had some plans for March and April and May get together with some people, go to work just as usual, go to school, do the things I normally do. I was planning to be in Israel last week with 28 other people, but it didn't happen. We've become more tentative in making our plans, and perhaps that's good. Maybe we'll consider a little more carefully. Maybe we'll live life a little more tentatively. Maybe we'll trust God's direction a little more intentionally. God wants to be involved in your planning. We're called to live dependently, trusting God's ultimate control. And when we live that way, there's no way we can be absolute. There's no way we can boast about our plans of how this is going to happen or that's going to happen because our plans are always in God's hands too. You know, it used to be that a lot of Christians would add a phrase when they were making plans. They would say something like, I'll see you next Sunday, Lord willing. And of course, some people would add, and the creek don't rise. And I guess that was probably a real experience for some. When I ministered in England, people used to write at the end of their phrase, D dot V dot. And I wasn't familiar with that phrase at all. But they would say something like, I'll write again soon, D dot V dot. And so since I didn't know what it was, I had to look it up and I found out it was the Latin for Deo Volente, meaning God willing. And they knew that their, their plans were dependent on God's will. And saying Lord willing at the end of every plan uh, could be just a Christian habit. It could lose its meaning. It could even be a superstition. But it's not a bad idea to add a few words sometimes to remind yourself 
and others that there is a much greater power than you at work. And I've started doing this more often in my emails. It's a good reminder for me that life is temporary. Now, James concludes with, with something we all should know. Verse 17, he says, anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Sin is not just the things we do against God. It's also the things we know are God's will and don't do. And James calls us to active faith, to do something. Faith must be working. It must be doing the good that you know to do. And the problem is we know so much, but we do so little. It's no wonder we need God's grace. And that's why we submit ourselves to him so we can receive grace and, and more grace. There's a battle going on in our lives every day. It's the battle with that invisible enemy, that our desires, the desires that, that Satan has inspired in us. Faith often doesn't seem natural for us. How can I really trust God when I don't know what will happen tomorrow? But that's how faith works. Trusting God, humbling ourselves before Him, coming near to Him, submitting to His will, and allowing Him to lift us up and pour on grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin, astonishing grace, extravagant grace. And that's what we all need to face the battle within. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us the power to fight the battle within. Thank you that your grace is sufficient. It's sufficient for all our trials, all the difficulties that we have. Thank you for giving us that grace that keeps on coming, not just when we become believers, but at the end, all the way through. Thank you, Lord, that your grace is big, big, and I need it, Lord. And just be with my friends who listen to this today and may we receive your grace with humility. In Jesus' name, amen. And now it's time for us to have communion together, even though we're apart. I'm here in uh, the church building of Blossom Valley Bible Church, but we must never forget that we are the church. You are the church. Whether you're at home or whether we're all together, whether you're completely alone or whether you're with some family or maybe some friends. So this would be time to get together your, your uh, communion elements, maybe some uh, bread or some crackers, um, maybe some sort of juice. Uh, grape juice is always the best uh, to remind us of what Christ did for us. Some of my most meaningful experiences have actually been having communion, not necessarily in a church building, but with some friends or with some family and sometimes even on my own. I remember being in China and there were three of us Americans and there was one Dutch lady and two Chinese younger people with us. And we had these tiny little plastic cups that were, were very fragile and we had just some, some bread that we used. And we took communion sitting on rock hard beds in a room in the, in the hotel which we were in. And we took communion and remembered the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. We didn't know if we were being bugged by the Chinese authorities or not, but we were meeting with Jesus there. I remember also taking communion with my cousin, his wife, my wife, just the four of us. We were in Florida visiting them and we had gone to a Saturday night service at a church, but they didn't have communion. And I always like to take communion on the first day of the week, the Lord's Day. That's just kind of who I am. And we just sat around and talked about communion, sat at their table. We ate some bread and drank some juice, and we remembered the death of Christ. And that was very meaningful to me. 
I remember being in India just last February, and I've been to several churches on Sunday uh, speaking and with several people in fellowship in their homes. It was, it was a great, great day. But some of the churches didn't have communion. And I, I like to take communion. So I had several of those little prepackaged communion that has the wafer in top and, and the juice in the bottom. I had them with me. And so for devotions that week, I was just reading through uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus, a, a little section at a time. And then I would take communion, just me. Well, I wasn't by myself. The Lord was with me in that hotel room. And it was meaningful. So today, as you take communion in your home, remember what Christ has done for you. Remember that, that He has forgiven your sins. And you may want to take a moment now just to, to confess, just to think about those sins that you've committed and how you want Him to forgive it with His grace. Let me pray. Lord, thank you so much for this bread that gives us a new connection again with your body that you died for us. Thank you for this juice that reminds us of your blood, that it's the, the blood of the new covenant, that now we live in grace, and you just pile that grace on us through so many ways. And we know that even now, you communicate your grace to us through this bread and through this juice. Thank you, Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. And if you have those elements, you can take with me and we just eat together. And we remember the blood of Jesus, which cleanses us of all sin. And as long as we do this, as often as we do this, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. God's blessing on you today. Bestowed on all who believe, you that are.